Okay, um, so today we're continuing our focus um, on gender-related forms of violence. Um, and particularly, um, now we're going to look at the question of intimate partner violence, um, which um, you'll see is often described using different words in different readings. Um, and that's because it's had a particular history as a, as a concept and, and the way in which it's been understood as a social problem. Originally, the focus on intimate violence um, really focused on women within marriage and love the history of the term, um, especially the, the, the one of the most common early terms in the field, domestic violence, really focuses on this. And it was, um, it was really the work of um, uh, feminist scholars who started identifying just how serious and common the problem of um, what was originally called wife battering, um, the, pr the problem of, of, of women in marriages being assaulted by their husbands. Um, and then gr that was gradually expanded from the notion of wife battering to the notion of domestic violence to show that it actually happens in much more varied um, forms and situations. Um, it's also used uh, in connection with the term family violence, but of course family violence doesn't necessarily um, only indicate violence between the intimate partners, it can also be violence, be intergenerational violence between parents and children, things like that. Um, and of course, intimate violence doesn't have to be in the family. There's lots of intimate relationships that don't, that, that, that take place outside the formal structure of the family. Um, so other terms like relationship violence um, are also used. But the, the, uh, currently, the, the most inclusive um, term that gets at exactly what we're trying to talk about here is, is this notion of intimate partner violence, that, that, that in a way, the violence between people who are kind of um, romantically involved or <clears throat> involved with a kind of ongoing, um, close, intimate relationship can, can happen in patterns that are different from other forms of violence. Um, and they need to be understood um, in their specificity in those particular patterns. Um, now, the first thing um, that we note about intimate partner violence is just how incredibly widespread it is. That it is, um, um, current research indicates that about a third of all um, the women in the world will experience intimate partner violence. There's also emerging research, of course, that shows that, that, that um, men and non-binary people experience intimate violence. So we need to be a little bit cautious about imagining that when we are talking about intimate partner violence, we are talking simply about the violence of men against women, which is how it was often defined um, in earlier generations of, of scholarship in this field. Um, so they are both male and female perpetrators, they're both male and female victims, um, and of course it extends to the complexity of, of non-binary identities and relationships. But there are a couple of striking features within that, um, and one of them is that the, the pattern of physical violence by men against women in intimate relationships um, is very, very common, um, to the extent um, that women are six times more likely um, to, to, to be murdered by intimate partners than men are. Men are, in fact, much more likely to be murdered by strangers. And it's interesting because men are more likely to be murdered in general than women are. But if, if women are murdered, they, they, they're, they're, the chances are it will be by someone who they are, are or have been very close to. And of course, this is very, very distressing. This is, this is another of these topics that it's, it's hard to just be kind of, um, have an emotional distance when talking about this because, because it's precisely a space in which one would, one would wish that there wasn't violence, but there wasn't excessive destructive conflict. Um, that, that, that this is violence that happens in a place which, which people really need to be a safe space, which is meant to be a safe space, um, a space of love and affection. Um, and to find that kind of space violated by um, coercive control, aggression, physical violence, 
um, is extremely distressing and for us to, and even the process of studying it is extremely di distressing um, so we need to we need to approach this sensitively and to pace ourselves and to reflect on um, whether um, you might want to perhaps not focus on certain issues um, and or or to choose something else um, if the material it does seem overwhelming um, because certainly it, it it is an emotionally challenging area okay so we've so we've we've said that there's these multiple terms that show the that you know the history of of intimate partner violence we've also said that it's extremely widespread and we've pointed out that although there is a prevalent pattern of men's violence against women um, there's also a great diversity um, firstly of the forms of intimate violence um, physical violence emotional violence forms of social control um, forms of coercive control that might not be considered violent but involve limiting what a person can do their access to material resources that it can happen in um, in heterosexual relationships can happen in same-sex relationships can happen in non-binary contexts um, it, 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 it really just pervades all situations where there, where, 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 where there is um, conflict and intimacy. Um, and it doesn't only affect um, the, 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 the people immediately involved. Often when it is in a, um, a family or caregiving environment, it also has a profound effect on children. And one of the big areas of we need to look at in intimate partner violence is is, is the negative impact that um, um, caregiving figures can have on um, on 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 developing children um, if if we're in situations where there is violence, and how that can uh, both harm young people, but also it can put them at risk of themselves becoming either victims or perpetrators within future um, intimate violence situations. So we need to think about all of those. And if you look at the, the, um, the second slide uh, in the presentation, you'll see um, an overview of, of uh, statistics. Um, and I'm just gonna just draw out some of them because to, just to give you a sense of the seriousness of this problem. So it says every week, at least one woman in Australia will be murdered by her current or former partner. Over 30 families in Victoria last year had to plan a funeral as a direct result of family violence. So this, this gives you an extent of the extent of the problem. Every two minutes, police in Australia are called to a family violence incident. In the 2014-15 financial year, there were 70,000 incidents of family violence recorded by police in Victoria. So th this means that uh, that 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 something like half of all police call outs are related to um, intimate violence. I mean, this is astonishing. I mean, that, 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 that police are called out as much for this one single kind of violence as all other criminal justice problems put together. I mean, this is, a, this, this is an astounding statistic when we reflect on it and gives us a, a, a sense that this is a, a very, very widespread and serious problem. Okay, further, one in four, a quarter of all um, uh, Australian children are exposed to um, family violence. Um, so this also gives us a sense it's, and the, the impact is not only on the, on the immediate victim, but also on the secondary victims who witness or are affected by it. And the, 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 the really troubling problem here is that those secondary victims are often exceedingly vulnerable because of their age. Um, linking it to other problems, 70% of homeless young people left home to escape family violence um, of one or another kind. So, 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 so the, these, these, these forms of violence actually then impact on, on other people and other social problems. The economic burden has been identified as being over $20 billion a year. Um, and family violence is the leading risk factor contributing to death and illness for Victorian women aged 14 to 24. Okay, so, so I mean, once again, it's a startling statistic, literally the leading risk factor for illness and death. Um, 
and um, it, and then also identifying just that there's certain people that are more vulnerable, um, people um, people living with disabilities, socially marginalized people, people who belong to 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 economically or or culturally marginalized group, groups are at even higher risks of these forms of violence, um, and. From a criminal justice perspective, here's an even the perhaps the most startling perspective of all. 80% of all people in prisons in Australia share the common experience of living with family violence as children. So, so um, you know, one doesn't want to sort of leap at um, simple causation, but but that a correlation can be that high. 80%. We almost never see correlations that high in the social sciences. 80% of children um, in prison end up, um, have experienced family violence. Now we need, to, we need to be very cautious with a number like that though. It shows us just how, how this has affected people whose who, who, who lives have ended up coming into conflict with the criminal justice system. What it leaves out is just how many children haven't um, come into to conflict with the criminal justice system despite having experienced family violence. Because that 80% that, that of people in prisons is a very small part of the 25% of all children who've experienced, um, who've witnessed family violence. So, so within identifying it as a huge risk factor, we also need to point out that it's not, there's not a simple causality, that in fact, um, the majority of people um, have different outcomes um, and have and 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 do in different ways live with manage um, and 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 find ways of escaping those histories of violence. Um, so we need to understand that in a little more depth. Okay, so what's different about intimate violence from other forms of violence? Um, and here we want to be really cautious. Um, one of the things that often happens when we're studying violence is that people kind of lock onto a particular causal factor and then ignore the complexity of the situation. We need to, we need to firstly say there's lots of different kinds of intimate violence that, that look quite different from each other. And there are lots of different perpetrators of intimate violence whose motives um, um, are, are perhaps very different from each other. So we don't want to reduce this to a, to a, a kind of simplistic underlying argument. But there are certain themes that are worth identifying and thinking about more deeply. The first is what's different from intimate violence to say getting mugged is, has got to do with the, the duration and repetition of the experience. Um, certainly we can be afraid to go to certain places or do certain things because we may, we may be attacked by an unknown person in those risky environments. But that's a very different thing to finding oneself in one's everyday environment, the environment you're continually in, the environment which, which, which is supposed to be your safe space, to find yourself a victim of violence there. Um, and, 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 and so there's not just a question of being victimized, there's a question of being, being trapped, not being able to escape from, from that victimization and the sense of the threat uh, of, of being continuously in a, in, in a state of threat um, and, 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 and how different that is from these kind of isolated violent assaults the unexpected assaults by a stranger in, when when one is in a in a public space or or a space that is not one's personal safe space. So it's, so so there's this question of 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 the duration of intimate violence. There's also a question of the emotional complexity. Getting getting attacked by someone who doesn't know you is different from being threatened by someone who you are at the same time, or perhaps have previously been in, a very intimate, affectionate, uh, emotionally important relationship. That, that creates emotional complexity um, that doesn't exist in violence between strangers. Um, and this becomes one of the, 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 the things that makes it much more difficult 
um, to deal with these forms of violence because it, because they're precisely violence that are that juxtapose against um, affection, intimacy, um, and 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 the person having such an important role um, in one's life. There are other sort of broader social factors that affect intimate violence. Um, things like the fact that people often end up in situations of economic dependency, that they end up, you know, being in a, in a relationship or marriage or having children with someone in a way that it becomes difficult to, to leave an abusive situation because, because it, would, it would require abandoning the resources that they have to have, the, the, the ability to, to feed their children or, 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 or the only shelter they have access to. Um, and often there's a lot of social pressure to maintain certain kinds of relationships, particularly marriage relationships. There's often huge kind of cultural pressure from families, from communities, from, from, from faith communities um, to stay in um, uh, marriage situations. And so people are actively discouraged from, from removing themselves from threatening situations and told that they should rather stay and try and work on them and try and fix them, even though this can be um, extremely dangerous. And linked to that is, a, is another thing that often intimate violence is defined as a personal problem rather than a social and criminal problem. Um, often um, there's the sense that, um, you know, if one sees someone being attacked on the street, people might feel the need to intervene. But if they hear the sounds of someone being attacked in the house next door, they may say, "No, no, that's 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 their personal business. This is not a this is not a matter for outsiders to intervene in." So the sense of a kind of division between public and private, and that private spaces are people's own responsibility, and um, and 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 so people's reluctance to try and to try and um, intervene. Uh, in in private spaces of conflict, um, the other thing we mentioned is that is is that the, the, that that intimate violence can involve other vulnerable people, and particularly we mentioned the case of children. But but one of the things that there's currently um, research on is the way in which 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 pets are used as uh, um, and become vulnerable in intimate relationships. That they become victims of violence or of coercive control. Um, or, or, or they, they become roots for threatening someone, and uh, if, 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 if they do certain things, or if they attempt to extricate themselves from an abusive relationship. Um, and one of the key things that we um, know about um, about violence and in intimate relationships is is that it. it, it follows certain patterns. And one of these patterns is commonly called as, uh, the cycle of violence, uh, which involves uh, elements of three different key elements, three different key phases, a phase where the violence emerges, the phase where the violence escalates, and then the phase um, where the violence um, sort of fades out and is replaced by something else. And it's important to understand the cycle of violence there. Um, because it is perhaps different from that sort of being assaulted by a stranger kind of uh, form of violence. So if you look um, at the fourth slide, there's a, there's a graphic illustration of the cycle of violence. Um, and, it, and, and if you, 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 you start on the top left, phase one being the tension building phase. And here we see that within a relationship, one of the partners starts um, going through an, a, a stage of kind of em, em, emotional tension and they start becoming um, irritable, aggressive, um, uh, threatening, uh, but it's clear that they, that, 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 that they, they, their kind of mood and state of mind is shifting in a toxic way. Um, and then this escalates into the explosive phase, which is the sort of middle violent, explicitly violent phase where there may be um, actual physical attacks, uh, serious verbal threats, um, use of, 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 of weapons. Um, and and this, is the, this is the kind of crisis moment. And this is often where 
the intervention is triggered. The police may be called at this moment. Um, but most interesting of all is the moment after that, the moment after the explosive um, uh, form of violence. So in the, in the tension building phase, the victim will often try and prevent the escalation. They'll often try and be uh, agreeable, supportive, reasoning, try and pander to the person, try and make them feel better, try and do things, the things they want. Um, whereas in the explosive situation, um, it's, it, it often then comes down to simply trying to protect oneself from, from, from the violence um, and trying to um, perhaps get, get some kind of support. But what's interesting is the third phase, which, which has been labeled as the, the, the honeymoon phase, is where, where after the violent explosion at some point, the, the, what, what, what is otherwise sort of the normal phase, the normal positive affectionate stage of the relationship can be restored. And often then the, 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 the person who was violent can become extremely apologetic and 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 make sort of all kinds of promises and make kinds of gestures of affection and feel um, genuinely kind of remorseful um, about what happened. I mean, arguably they can also, you know, put on an act of manipulative re remorse, but we can also allow for the possibility that the that the that the person who's been violent feels feels really um, distressed by what has happened, doesn't wish to repeat it. Um, and but certainly has very very intensely wants to restore um, the relationship that they've damaged, um, and this and it's understanding this phase, this third phase, um, that helps us understand why intimate violence is so dangerous. Because normally, if someone was violent, you you simply stay away from them. I mean, this is the first strategy: is not to be there. Um, and but but the the problem with intimate violence is when it cycles back to this third phase of of of, of recreating the fact that oh no this is potentially a positive situation this is potentially an affectionate important valuable situation and that the violence is is kind of an anomaly which 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 could be avoided um, and this is what makes them dangerous is the perpetuation of the belief that. That the affection is what is 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 normal. The violence is what is um, what is unusual and erratic, and that um, that simply by um, doing what needs to be done to avoid the repetition of the violence, that a healthy relationship um, can come into being. One of the problems here is precisely that the victim is often made to feel that they are responsible for ensuring that the violence doesn't escalate again. So the victim is blamed for the violence, that if, if they hadn't done this, if they hadn't made the person feel jealous or feel angry, then the violence wouldn't have happened. And so, um, it, so, so, so intrinsic in the cycle of violence is a very, very powerful um, pattern of victim blaming and making the person who's, who's threatened by the violence feel like they are actually the reason for the violence. And so the, so the responsibility is shifted away from the person who is violent onto the, 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 the person who's being threatened. And, 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 and they can be made to feel like if they just did the right things, if they just managed to you know, keep the kids quiet, make dinner on time, not speak to any of their friends in a way that made the perpetrator feel jealous. Um, and so, so it creates a kind of a, 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 a threatening and controlling situation for the victim where they, they, they start being in danger of organizing their whole life, giving up their autonomy um, in order to, 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 to prevent the, 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 the violent person becoming violent. And this creates a very, very dangerous psychological form of entrapment, which is explained very, very well in the, the Herman reading on captivity, which I've, um, which I've added as an additional reading um, for this week. Um, to, because it's important to under, understand that pattern, because one of the, 
one of the, the things that is often f frustrating for people who try and assist those who are trapped in abusive relationships is, is that the, 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 the fact that people in those relations often don't want to leave them. Their goal is not simply to escape safely from the relationship. Their, their, their goal is to make the relationship a good one, to make it a, uh, to, to simply remove the abuse of violent element and to hold on to the caring, intimate elements of the relationship. Um, and so often there's this, there's this um, frustration that the person doesn't leave the relationship, doesn't press criminal charges, returns to the abusive partner. Um, and 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 unless the unless the 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 psychological entrapment that is created in the cycle of violence is properly understood, it's very very hard to understand why people seem to to um, allow themselves to continue to be in um, destructive relationships that are potentially violent. Um, but so to avoid that kind of misunderstanding and victim blaming, um, we need to understand the psychology of that cycle of violence. Um, okay, the next thing that it's really important to do is to understand the kind of social factors that contribute. And I'm going to, to, to sort of link two different ways of thinking, the one that focuses on social factors and the other that focuses on, on psychological factors. But of course, these are not separate. They're deeply interconnected. Um, but there are a few things we know um, about intimate violence. Firstly, it's very much more common in societies that have patterns of overall gender inequality. So the more you have uh, overall systems of gender inequality, the, the greater the risk of violence emerging in intimate relationships. And the more you have gender polarization, traditional notions of masculinity, um, uh, one gender being given kind of social privilege, having more access to material resources, being more protected by the criminal justice system, um, having, having more social authority, being more trusted, the more you have all of those kinds of gendered um, inequities, the more you have the risk of gender violence. So in fact, one of the, one of the important and effective ways of, of, of reducing intimate violence is, is simply reducing gender inequality in society. Um, and this relates specifically to the maintenance of rigid gender identity norms and roles, and particularly the way certain forms of masculinity um, uh, have been normalized and are, and, are, and are those fit with certain kinds of femininity. And remember when we were talking about sexual violence, we talked about the kind of the normalization of kind of aggressive, controlling, assertive masculine identities and, and its flip side, the normalization of submissive, acquiescent um, feminine gender identities and how those actually created the risk of gender violence. Well, they create an even greater risk of intimate partner violence precisely by normalizing aggression and submission as intrinsic to, um, to gendered relationships. Of course, we've said that, that it's not only kind of heterosexual, traditionally gendered relationships that, that have intimate violence, but that is a very serious risk factor in certain um, environments, particularly where there's an acceptance of um, traditional notions of male dominance um, and rigid ideas of, of traditional masculinity, um, and specifically um, where, they, where they rely on this sort of binary of male dominance, ma masculine dominance and feminine submissiveness. Other sort of social risk factors is, is the way in which some societies n normalize violence as an acceptable problem solving strategy for men. And it's interesting how that's gendered. Um, the way in which men using violence, like boys will be boys, oh, let them sort it out, um, is, 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 is a kind of a, an, a is, is a authority that is given to men to exercise violence. Um, as a problem solving strategy, which, which often isn't equally handed to women. Um, and of course, a more relevant and obvious um, factor that is normalized is, in some societies is the use of, of coercive control, um, coercive behavior in relationships, the extent to which 
demanding kind of submission that, you know, like wives submit to your husbands as kind of um, religious traditions or cultural traditions that actually totally normalize uh, inequality in relationships, normalize one partner being dominant and the other being submissive. The, 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 that in itself then creates a risk um, um, of intimate violence and of coercive control. Um, and of course, the, the final broad factor is the extent to which societies normalize violence across the board, normalize violence, dominance, inequality as in, in all realms, in, 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 you know, in, in, in policing and social control, in economic advancement, in negotiating social status. Um, and where those factors are, are, are normalized, they, they, they then, of course, but become normalized within intimate spaces too and become risk factors. So, so to understand intimate violence, we need to understand both the broad sort of gendering of identities, um, but also the broad normalization of um, control, coercion, and violence as ways of negotiating um, differences between people um, that occur in multiple different ways. Um, but we can also look at the interaction of those social factors and some psychological factors. And we've talked before about one of the factors that seems to be linked to violence is, is often a limited capacity to empathize with others, that it's easier, um, we've argued, to exercise um, what we called instrumental violence, that kind of cold-blooded, controlling violence towards people if you don't feel any empathy for what that violence feels like for them. Um, and the other thing that we identified previously um, is the way in which um, uh, emotional violence, the kind of passionate, um, intensely emotional violence, that outbursts violence, which we called expressive violence, how that is often linked to a, a sort of difficulties people can have in managing their own intense emotions. Um, and so these two factors, which remember we talked about in terms of attachment theory, we talked, of, that we talked about this in terms of, 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 of the way in which um, children who are neglected and abused and, and don't have strong positive attachment experiences can actually either develop limited capacity or have difficulties in regulating their intense emotions. Um, and, and, and both of these can, can be elements of intimate violence. Within looking at that, one also needs to, to sort of look at the differences because often intimate violence is this kind of painting of a particular kind of, of monster, uh, a, a, a person who is just cruel, controlling. Um, they just are like, um, um, sort of cold-hearted bullies um, who are controlling and abusive in all aspects. Um, and this is, in fact, a relatively unusual uh, model. It does certainly happen, but it isn't the most common context of intimate violence. Um, there are certainly um, some people who are, who are regularly, predictably, you know, every time they start drinking, every time they feel kind of jealous, every time they're stressed at work, they, they, they start gravitating towards becoming abusive. But there are, there are also situations where people are, are almost never abusive. And then the relationship is, 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 for the overwhelming most part, actually, a, you know, fairly normal, but suddenly becomes extremely severely dangerous. And so you have these sort of typical stories of oh, but this was such a nice guy and, you know, everyone knew him and, and then suddenly he just killed his wife and kids and everyone's aghast and couldn't predict it. Um, and, and that's a slightly different pattern. Um, that's, of course, not to ignore the fact that often people who appear publicly as very personable, as, you know, lovely people are in private capable of ongoing um, bullying, manipulation, control, violence. Um, and one of the dangers with the, the, the ongoing patterns is that they normalize the violence, is that the violence becomes something that is, that, that just becomes like built into the relationship. 
And not only does it become built in, there's a danger in what, that once it's normalized, it can escalate. So what starts as being certain kinds of tone of voice becomes uh, certain kinds of threats, becomes certain kinds of physical blows, which be become even more dangerous and injuring and potentially fatal blows. Um, so there's a real risk within the repetitive um, context of, of violence that they can actually escalate and become more dangerous. But a couple of quite interesting specific emotional issues are often identified. And one of the key ones is um, sort of warning signs and risk factors is the existence of a kind of paranoid and angry jealousy. Um, the sense that the person feels very, very triggered by, by, by jealous feelings. Um, it can be other feelings, for instance, exactly in the way that Gilligan talked about the way in which um, some masculinities are triggered by feelings of humiliation and, and that those lead to aggression. So it can be feelings of loss of control, feelings of, of humiliation, but often it, in the case of intimate relationships, it's feeling of, 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 of um, unmanageable jealousy. Uh, and so one of the warning signs in these relationships is a pattern of social isolation and control, a pattern where the, the um, potentially violent person starts by making the, making the vulnerable person feel bad about their friendships, about their closeness with their own families, and, and, and the fact that they talk to other people and want to spend time with their, their family and friends. And so increasingly start um, undermining those broader kind of social contacts to isolate the person um, because of this kind of un, un, unmanageable sort of feelings that, that if the person is giving attention to anyone else, then they are in some sort of psychological way perceived as abandoning um, the, um, the, 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 the person who's at risk of becoming violent. Um, linked to that, we often see patterns of um, emotional instability and, and depression in, in people who, are, who, who can be at risk of being perpetrators of intimate violence. Um, so, so often we will see that being managed by sort of various kinds of substance use, um, you know, alcohol or other drugs, which of course serve to worsen the problem, although they may sort of temporarily in some ways help the person not be overwhelmed by the intensity of the, uh, of, of, of the negative feelings they have. It, of course, then can risk escalating their responses. It can lead to, you know, drunken or amphetamine-fed rages um, that can be even more dangerous. Um, but, but, in addition to the sort of paranoid and angry, angry jealousy, one of the key sort of psychological risk factors, which we, should, which we should always take very seriously if they are present, is a tendency to blame other people for negative emotions, a tendency to not identify, well, well you know, I feel bad when you do that because I have a history of, um, you know, abandonment, mistreatment as a child, but a, but a sense of like, the other person is the one doing something wrong. The other person who spends time with their family or, or on social media or talking to their friends, they are, they are causing the negative emotions. So this kind of projection of the negative emotions onto the partner and a blaming them. And, and so this, this, this sort of paranoid projection um, of the bad feelings, not as things that are challenges within the person, but as things that are caused by the partner. This is a this is this is a very very serious warning sign that there's a risk of 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 of, of violence um, and abuse following from that situation. So when we look at all of this together. Um, we can see a number of, of interacting social and psychological factors. Firstly, children who are exposed to violence, who, who grow up in, in violent and abusive homes, are at risk of normalizing that violence, of just thinking, well, that's the way normal people have relationships. And they don't only risk normalizing it as perpetrators. They don't only risk, well, well that's you know what my parent did, so it's just natural that I will do that. They, they also risk normalizing it as victims. 
they almost they, they they also risk accepting the fact that being threatened um being caught in a escalating pattern of violence is is simply the cost of of being in a relationship with any person and so they don't seek help they don't seek to 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 um uh, find a way out of the the abuse they 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 simply um, it's been so normalized in their early experience that they that that they they don't have a sense of the red flags. Um, um, another important factor is how clearly this what some of the things we've said now link to attachment theory, and um, how children who have been exposed to violence and neglect can, as we showed before, be, be, but you know through looking at how attachment actually either enables or fails to enable people to develop certain capacities, how they might be at risk of either not um, readily feeling empathy, not readily understanding how much harm they're doing when they are aggressive towards other people, but also that it can lead them to feel like their negative emotions are unmanageable, that they don't have that, that sense of, 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 um, of, 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 of being able to manage um, feelings like jealousy, abandonment, uh, humiliation, um, and so so those th those things are, are experiences being catastrophic, and so they react very badly to 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 the the ways in which those over feelings of of um, are overwhelming. And here it's important to know that that the kind of the lack of empathy model, the one that we talked before, that sort of cold controlling. Um, as we said, isn't the, the most common. More often, it's the, the sort of emotionally unstable, explosive pattern. And, and the important thing here is what's happening when, as in that honeymoon period, when the, when the relationship is not abusive, that often abusive relationships actually feel a lot of the time better than normal relationships actually they feel they feel more emotionally engaged they feel more attentive they feel that the, that the person has more concern um, um, uh, for the other person and they actually feel perhaps more intimate um, that that and 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 although that 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 sort of concern and intimacy and involvement may be an expression of kind of deep insecurity it, it can make the relationship actually seem very, very good outside the abusive moments. And, and here's the real danger, is, is, is precisely the kind of instability between the, the intensity, the positive intensity of the non-abusive moments, um, and then how those sort of then suddenly unravel into the abusive moments. And, 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 and that's what really creates the kind of risk and the difficulty of, of, of either escaping from or managing the danger in those relationships. Um, so we've, we've said there that the kind of key risk factor is, is intimacy linked to, to jealousy. Um, and specifically, the, the failure to recognize that that, that one's own difficult emotions are actually arise inside oneself because of personal things, rather than the idea that they are, they are caused by someone else. Um, and that, 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 that emphasis on the kind of being caused, that we, we see this in one of the, the sort of one, most recurring accusations um, in abusive relationships is often in the form of why do you make me do this? Why do you make me so angry? So the victim is seen as the cause of the violence and the perpetrator is, is, sees themselves as the victim. They see themselves as, as, and in fact, in some sense, they are overwhelmed by uncontrollable emotions. It's just that they, they assume that, that those emotions have been caused by the other person rather than by the, the, the challenges that they have in dealing with their own experiences. And this then makes the victim feel like the abuse is, is their fault and that the responsibility for preventing violence rests with them changing their behavior. And so we see these, these kind of three key elements in, 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 in the structure of abuse. The first one, um, the presence of negative feelings that are, that are overwhelming and can't be managed. 
Um, secondly, that those negative feelings are, are presented as being the other person's fault, that they're kind of projected onto the other person there. The victim is blamed for the unmanageable negative feelings of, 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 the, of the abusive partner. And then when that is then combined with a social context which, in which um, manipulation, control, and aggression have been normalized, that either the partners have grown up in a, a family in which that was quite common, or, they've, or they're existing in a society with, in which that is quite common. Um, those three elements, when, when they start locking together, you, you've, you have a very, very high-risk situation. Um, and that's when we need to start really understanding those statistics of that just how many people this affects, just, just how the, the extent to which it leads not only to psychological harm, but to physical injury and even death um, in intimate relationships, but also how hard it is to escape um, from the kind of psychological um, state of being trapped in those relationships. And that's before we even address the kind of the economic, the kind of the social pressures that often trap people in, in abusive relationships. Okay, so to tie up today, I'm just then going to link that back to the notion of toxic masculinity. And remember, when we talked about to toxic masculinity, we, we were really clear in that, that the term toxic masculinity isn't a claim that masculinity is toxic. It's a claim that there are, that there are multiple masculinities and that some of them are toxic both for the people who have those identities and for the people around them. Um, and that toxic, that, that, that toxic masculinities actually are, are also toxic for, for the men who identify with them um, and who find themselves trapped in those identities. Um, so, so, so linking intimate partner violence back to toxic masculinity, and we've seen this in, in our previous lectures on bullying, um, and um, child abuse, that this pattern of punishing boys for expressing vulnerability, the kind of boys don't cry, don't go crying to mommy, that kind of nonsense, that, that this, this, this then makes it very difficult for, for people who've been, who've been bullied into those forms of masculinity or had those forms of masculinity normalized in them, it makes it very difficult for them to actually be properly aware and to have strategies for managing those kind of vulnerable emotions. And vulnerable emotions are things that are, 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 are almost necessarily present in intimate relationships. That, that's almost the nature of intimacy, is that it's also linked to vulnerability. Similarly, having a sort of toxic forms of masculinity that, 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 that almost require men to deal with issues by exerting dominance and control and denies them the space to feel emotional insight and, to, and, and, and denies them the opportunity to learn effective interpersonal problem-solving skills. All of these then become additional factors. And, these, and obviously these then combine into the, exactly the situation we were describing, where lack of understanding of one's own emotional di distress, whether that's anxiety, jealousy, helplessness, feelings of, of abandonment, um, links to, because the emotions aren't well understood by the person feeling them, they feel like the emotions are being caused by something out in the world. And the, and the thing out in the world in these cases is generally then imagined to be the, the, the actions of the intimate partner. And that's where you get the, why do you do this to me, kind of, that, that, that is such a, a crucial part of the victim blaming and the escalation of violence, um, where one's own difficult emotions are experienced as, as, as persecution from external sources. Um, and of course, then the, 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 the broad social context here um, in terms of, of, of the gendering of society is how if this happens in a context in which some people, specifically people who've been sort of defined by masculine um, identities, um, feel that they, they are authorized to use violence, that you know, from childhood that they were encouraged to, 
to solve problems using aggression. Uh, and at that point, there's a, that, that if, 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 if that use of violence in an interpersonal crisis has already been normalized, we're creating a, a very, very dangerous situation. So we note a couple of things in conclusion. Firstly, that intimate violence is different because it's, it tends to be part of an ongoing situation, part of a pattern. Um, we notice also that it follows certain cycles, that it tends not to just be, oh, they're good relationships and bad relationships. In fact, the bad relationships are ones that are often good a lot of the time, even very good a lot of the time, but they go through cycles um, of going from very good to very bad. And that's what makes them so hard to, to, to deal with and hard to understand and hard to, uh, and hard to manage and escape from. Um, and that, and, and, but, but that we need to look specifically at the way in which um, allowing a society which either makes the experiences of abuse and neglect for children actually quite common and doesn't provide people, especially doesn't provide um, boys, you know, growing up into adult masculine identities, the appropriate skills for articulating their vulnerabilities, understanding their vulnerability, seeking help, um, and, and, and negotiating um, conflicts and crisis situations. But the societies that doesn't offer those things necessarily then creates um, the risk that intimate partner situations are going to be violent. Um, so we need to consider all of these. We need to consider the broad kind of context of the way in which people can be socially and economically marginalized that traps them in dependency on other people. We can see in the way in which early experiences normalize um, abuse and violence. We can see the way in which um, certain um, kinds of neglect and abuse can actually make it very hard for people to manage um, emotional crises and, and can make um, the vulnerability of intimacy feel very, very threatening. And that they, 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 this, is, this is exacerbated in a situation where, where kind of low levels of coercion, dominance, you know, submit to your husband, all of those kinds of thinking are actually normalized. Um, and so we see a package constructed of a number of, of, of different strands from the cultural factors, the economic factors, the psychological factors, and the, and, and the, and the um, gender arrangements of a society that, that actually cre cre create this very specific, incredibly high risk situation, which is the risk of, of violence precisely in those situations um, that should pro provide the most care, the most protective and the most support.